welcome. I am Dr. Kim Benson of the Inner Healing Academy. And today we're going to be looking at the important topic of dairy consumption and how consuming dairy products might be affecting our health and well being. And to help me to expand upon this important topic, I have Dr. Clapper. But before we get into the conversation, I'm going to read a short bio, just in case you may not be familiar with Dr. Clapper's most excellent work. So Dr. Michael Clapper, MD, is a graduate of the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago. He received postgraduate training in internal medicine, surgery, anesthesiology and orthopedics at University of British Columbia teaching hospitals in Vancouver and obstetrics at the University of California in San Francisco. He has practiced acute care medicine in Hawaii, Canada, California, Florida and New Zealand. Far more fulfilling to him is his current practice, focusing on health promoting food and lifestyle choices to help people prevent the need for hospitalization and surgery. A longtime radio host and a pilot, Dr. Clapper has served as nutrition advisor to NASA's programs for space colonists on the moon and Mars, and on the nutrition task force of the American Medical Students Association. To improve his own health and to minimize suffering of sentient beings, Dr. Clapper adopted a plant-based diet in 1981. On his website, which is drclapper.com, visitors can find the latest nutrition information through his numerous articles and videos and support his Moving Medicine Forward initiative to promote applied nutrition being taught in medical schools. So that gives you a little bit of a background there. So welcome, Dr. Clapper. I am just so honored and delighted to have you as my guest. It's I really, to be with you. True, yeah, I couldn't think of anybody better to help talk about these, these important topics of, of uh, everything that's involved with consuming dairy. We've all heard of lactose intolerance, acne, asthma, allergies, even cancer has been linked in some way to the consumption of dairy. So yes, th uh, thank you for being here to help me to um, unravel this. Now I know that you yourself were uh, brought up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, I believe, but there obviously came a time in your life when you took a closer look at your diet and things changed. So perhaps you could just take us back to that time and let us know what it was that caused this change for you. Oh my, well, thank you, Kim. It's lovely to be with you. and Thank you for exploring these very important topics. Uh, as you mentioned, I did much of my growing up on my uncle's dairy farm in Wisconsin uh, in the 1950s. The polio epidemics would sweep through the big cities in the United States, and my parents would whisk me up to our, my uncle's dairy farm in Wisconsin to get us out of the cities. And I experienced uh, my first uh, 15 summers up there and uh, kind of uh, grew into the natural world up there and farm work. And... My parting the ways with dairy products, because I milk cows every summer, I milk hundreds and hundreds of cows, and, um, and I did it because it was what a good farm boy did, and you just uh, tried to help out my uncle and drove tractors and slung hay bales and did whatever you need to do, never really thought twice about the entire process that I was helping out with it was more important to be a helpful young man on the farm. <clears throat> And my parting of the way with dairy products, as you're asking about, actually happened in kind of a delayed uh, series of events, because one of the earliest and most painful memories I carry in my head is the sound of a mother cow in the, in the dairy barn locked up in a stanchion with her newborn calf. Uh, in the veal pen, I didn't know it was the veal pen, in a pen 10 yards away from her. And she would bellow hour after hour after hour, the most painful, heart-rending, soul-tearing bellows. 
And I was a seven, five year old kid. I, you know, I didn't really know what was going on. Well, we, and I would ask, why is the calf in the pen? Well, we're taking care of him. And we would, we would bring some of the excess milk over to the calf and it would suck out of a bucket with a nipple on it. And I thought, well, that we're just taking good care of the calf. And um, a week or two, and the mother would bellow. This would go on for days and nights. It was the most haunting, so I still remember it. And then she would eventually, by day five or six, she would stop bellowing. And I realized it's because the calf was gone. And the calf had disappeared. And it never didn't dawn on me where the calf went. And, uh, and the, dairy was, uh, the dairy barn was always sad. There were always tears running down the eyes of the, of the cows. And there was an air of sadness and heaviness about the place. I, but I never really understood, because maybe the cows just wanted to be outside, which they did. Uh, but I drank my milk and ate cheese and did everything that a boy in the 1950s did. It didn't really dawn on me. Uh, time went on. I uh, went to medical school, became a physician. And uh, in the 19, it was 1979, 1980, uh, early 1981, I uh, was... Out, I was doing a residency in anesthesiology. I was going to be an anesthesiologist. And I was out for dinner one night with another resident in Vancouver. And by this time, I had become very spiritually intense young man. And I was really trying to live a life of nonviolence. I'd seen so much violence in the emergency rooms in Chicago and Vancouver. I really at least wanted to get the violence out of my own life. So I made a study of living a nonviolent life. Uh, and I read Mahatma Gandhi and the Indian Saints and uh, all about a life of Ahimsa. And I was feeling very self-satisfied on my path of nonviolence. And I was pontificating about this uh, to a friend of mine while polishing off a porterhouse steak at the local Keg and Cleaver restaurant in Vancouver. And he looked at me and said, yeah, well, Michael, don't you, uh, don't you realize that in satisfying your taste for the, the desire for the taste of flesh in your mouth, you're paying for the death of that animal and for the next one in line at the slaughterhouse. And as soon as he said that, all the old the, the rationalizations came into my head. Well, well, the cow's dead already, and that's what they raised them for. But before I could get the words out of my lips, the little voice on my shoulder said, you know, it's right. It's right. Mm -hmm. And when I went up to pay for this steak dinner, I felt complicit in a crime. And at that point, I knew I couldn't run away anymore because I saw the memories of seeing the old dairy on the farm, seeing the old dairy cow shot in the head. I chopped the head off chickens. I knew the violence inherent in, in getting any kind of meat onto the plate. Uh, there's just no way around it. The farm, farming is a violent activity. Uh, inherently. And so as I uh, immediately I swore off me, I'm not going to pay for that. I want to disengage from that system. It w didn't take long uh, when I saw the cruelty of factory farming and the industrialization of death on this massive scale just to satisfy the taste for humans. At that point, it was just a couple of months later, suddenly it, the penny dropped and it dawned on me what those cow, what I was hearing in that dairy barn. And I realized that the dairy industry, the, the people say, well, you don't have to kill the cow to get the milk. Yes, you do. Um, the dairy barn is a short stopping off place on the way to the slaughterhouse for these animals. Uh, no dairy cow dies of old age. After five or six years, as their milk production goes down after a few years of calves, my uncle would, would note that they were giving less milk, and he would call the, the truck from the slaughterhouse, and we'd load old Bossy up there, and, and off she would be gone and made into hamburger. I didn't know that. But I, it, it, then it, I realized in order to keep that milk flowing, you know, people think, well, the cows in the dairy barn giving milk, that's what cows do. No, they don't. They are mammals like any other mammals. There's only one reason a female mammal is lactating is because she just had a baby. And I remember when a cow would come into her fertile time, we'd lock her up in the stanchion. We'd call the man from Badger Breeders. He'd come out. He would ram a tube full of bull semen into her uterus. No cow like that, I'll tell you. I saw that many times. Very distressing. 
she would get, she would conceive, get pregnant, carry that baby for nine months. And just like a human mother, give birth to a 65 pound baby, if you can imagine that. Mm -hmm. And they loved their little kids. They would go off in the woods to hide from the men who would take their babies where they knew. Uh, and the, the bond between a mother cow and her baby is so strong. But the, and the baby wants to suckle on, on mom's udder like all baby mammals do. And that's the natural order of things. But for my uncle, that's money lost. Uh, that baby is sucking up his profits. And within 24, at the most 48 hours, that he would come along and scoop that baby up into the veal pen. And, and that mother would be locked up in the stanchion. And that's what that, that bawling and crying and mooing was about. And it, and it dawned on me, in order to keep that milk flowing, you must, 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 the uh, rules of dairy, you must keep making cows pregnant, let them have their baby and take that calf away from its mother to, and, and take that milk for your morning coffee or whatever, make cheese or whatever you make from it. Dairy, it's inherent in the dairy operation. It's a cruel industry. It involves taking babies away from their mothers consistently. And what ha and that's why those mothers got those big tears going down their eyes. They just had their baby taken. Those are real tears. Mm -hmm. I used to think, well, they're just perspiring. No, they're weeping for their, for their, for their baby. I've never, and, heard, uh, I've never heard about the tears before. I'd heard about the bellowing and the calling. But I, I'd well, never heard about the tears. If, if you wanted, I, I have pictures in my slideshow of the dairy barn. You see these tears going down the mother's eye. And I remember so many of the cows have that. And finally, what happens to those baby calves? And they're babies. You know, they, they just want their mother and the milk. And they're crying. You can hear their lonely balls coming from that veal pen. It's pathetic. It's so sad. Uh, if, it's, if they're a girl calf, they wind up a four-legged milk pump like their mother for a few years, then they get made into hamburger. Um, and if they're a little, unfortunate enough to be a little boy calf, they spend 16 weeks chained by the neck in a, in a veal crate so they can't move around, so their muscles don't get strong, so their flesh stays pale. And at 16 weeks, they're shot in the head and their throats are cut and the flesh stripped from their bones for milk-fed veal. And so the veal industry is, a, is an absolutely essential part of the dairy industry. You can't, every other calf's a boy and you can't, what do you do with all these boy calves? You can't let them all grow up into be bulls. So they're made into veal after four months. And so the dairy industry has this era or of, of happy cows in the pasture, frolicking in the sun and the mother and the little baby. But the truth is, it's a cruel, cruel industry, and it's a bloody industry, it's a slaughter industry. Mm -hmm. um, but as I said, just a few years of calves and milk get produced along the way. But have no illusions about what the slaughter industry is, mm -hmm. or what the dairy industry is. So you're asking, when did it? When did dairy products and I part company? Shortly, yeah. when I had to defend. Well, I, I could, I could be very militant. Well, I'm not going to eat meat anymore, but dairy, well, maybe. And then. Somebody spelled it out for me, Michael, don't you understand? You grew up on a farm, or don't you know what you were seeing? And as soon as they said it, it all fell into place. And, uh, and, and back then in 1980s, the only substitute for milk was this dreadful powdered soy powder that just stirred into water, never really dissolved. But nowadays, you've got all these glorious hemp milk and oat milk and rice milk and almond milk and cashew cheeses and all these wonderful things to put on your cereal and your and your sandwiches. There's no real reason to be using this archaic, cruel, unhealthy uh, product that comes from the dairy industry. So, mm -hmm. you know, we used to harpoon whales, you know, and now we say, oh my God, I can't believe we did that. Well, you know, we used to breed cows and take their babies away and take their milk. I, I, it should become one of those things that we used to do. I can't believe we used to yeah, do that. I'm, I'm hopeful that one day that it will be a exactly, thing. Exactly. I'm really hopeful. And the more that we can, you know, share the, the insights here, because in, in a way, people just don't know what's going on. Like you, you rightly said, people have this image of these happy dairy cows in, you know, on the farm having a lovely time, but it's it's not it could not be further from the truth you know it's all marketing absolutely mm -hmm. and uh 
And, and every time, and not to make people feel guilty, but just to know that every time you're in the supermarket and you take that the, the yogurt off the shelf or, you know, the Greek yogurt or the, or the cheese or, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the creamer for your coffee that are made from dairy. Uh, every time you do that and you pay for it, you say, yes, take another calf or another baby away from its mother, you know, you know, cut it and shoot another old dairy cow in the head. Mm-hmm. And, and we're paying for this cruelty and, and there's no need for it. It should recede into the, no. into the dark chapters of history. That's right. And most people are kind and they're compassionate towards yes. animals. So when they know, when they really know what's going on, most people, you know, will make a different choice. And like you said, there's lots of alternatives out there now. Armour milk, cashew, coconut. Oh, it's, it's just endless. So why why just stick with cow's milk if you know it's causing such a lot of suffering? So let's just move on now to, to milk yes. itself. What is actually in milk and what is, you know, the main purpose of milk? Let's just, you know, to talk about that. Sure, really. Well, we need to, I mean, it's such a powerful and large question. What's in the milk? Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a number of things that should flash red lights at us humans saying, you don't want to be eating this stuff. Uh, first of all, um, our, you know, again, it's wonderful, wonderful, perfect natural food if you are a baby calf, seriously. And it, and it will let a little 65 pound calf blow up to a 1500 pound cow within a year because it's filled with growth factors and proteins that support uh, rapid growth. Uh, and the problem is there it's bovine proteins, uh, the lactalbumin, the casein. Uh, and when many, many people consume these proteins, they don't react kindly in the body. Um, and they're associated with everything from eczema to asthma to sinusitis to postnasal drip. Uh, and uh, there's there's you know studies either way, but I can just tell you after now almost 40 years of doing nutrition medicine, uh, with when, as soon as you pull the dairy products or true cow's milk products out of the diet, so half the kids with asthma that's the end of their asthma. Uh, you know about a, about a third of the folks with eczema that's the end of their eczema. Psoriasis gets better. The post nasal drip stops in almost everybody. Uh, you you see that this was you know a contaminated fuel to be putting in our metabolic engine. So the the proteins are the bovine proteins not friendly. Second, again, this is you know as I said in the Cowspiracy movie, this is baby calf growth fluid. That's what the stuff is. And everything is there to blow that baby calf up into a great big cow, including a hormone that the mother makes as well, and our own liver makes it when all the cow protein hits it. And this is a hormone called insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1. And this promotes growth throughout the body. And great if you're a young baby calf, or you're a six-week-old baby calf, you want lots of IGF-1. But if you're a woman with a breast lump, or you're a guy with, a, with an early prostate cancer, and uh, as well as if you don't know it, and you're consuming an IGF-1, it, well, your body responds and things grow. And clearly, uh, the more dairy a woman eats, the, the faster any breast cancer she has will grow. The more dairy products, more cheese a boy eats, the higher his risk for prostate cancer when he becomes an adult. Uh, again, this is baby calf growth fluid, and it's uh, it's the wrong fuel to be putting in our uh, in our metabolic machine here. Plus, there's two other things that should give people pause. When a female mammal, whether it is a fox or a cow or a human mother, uh, is pregnant, her body is filled with estrogen, and it's a magical, wonderful hormone, especially during pregnancy, uh, and That's all great, but all her tissues become saturated with estrogen, uh, in and including the uh, when the when she has a baby, the milk that uh, that the mother secretes is full of estrogens. Uh, That's fine for a few months, uh, uh, you know, temporarily for a uh, for a human baby or for a uh, for a baby calf, Uh, but normally. When as soon as a female mother who's all, who is already nursing, whether it's a, 
a, a fox who just had a who's had a litter or a, you know a mother mink who had a litter of kids. Well, as soon as she gets pregnant, she stops lactating. She stops giving milk. Why? Because nature's smart, and she knows that if, if that fox or that um, that mink uh, had you know eight kits and four of them are males. She doesn't want to be giving them milk full of estrogens because it'll feminize the male little ones. And so that's why when a female mammal gets pregnant, she stops lactating. It's time to wean the, the kids. And that's the way it should work. And that's the way it worked on my uncle's dairy farm. Now, when we only milked 49 cows and when one got pregnant, my uncle would take out his notebook. Well, bossy number 17 won't give milk till she has her calf in the spring. And that's just the way it was, biology. We had no choice. Well, today's modern dairy operation, they are milking a thousand cows, 2000 cows twice a day. They can't afford to have their best milkers go offline for nine months while they're carrying their calf. So they have genetically modified the cows. And so now the cows will give milk all the way through their next pregnancy. They're carrying their, their calf and they're still giving milk. Well, as I mentioned earlier, their body's full of estrogens and the milk is full of estrogens that comes out. And so today's dairy products are made from the milk of pregnant cows and the estrogen contents of the, of the milk is shockingly high. And I'm not talking about the puny little phytoestrogens in soy products. I'm talking about estradiol, estro, um, uh, uh, estradiol, pregnandiol, uh, pregnenolone, these are official mammalian estrogens. They are biologically active. When boys consume them, their testosterone levels fall. When girls consume them, you know, we've got these, our girls are going through puberty at age nine and 10. Could it have something to do with this river of milk and cheese and ice cream and yogurt? They're shoving down their gullet and we're telling them to for your bones, you know. And meanwhile, it, you know, you get these powerful estrogen effects. And you follow these girls into womanhood, they get a higher risk of breast cancer and the guys get prostate cancer. And so what, you know, we're asking what's in that milk, a shocking level of estrogens are now in that milk. That's not good. Uh, and then finally, there's all the contaminants. They, they feed these poor cows grains that are sprayed with herbicides and pesticides, and that concentrates in the cow's milk, so that winds up in the milk. Cows get leukemia. They get caused by a virus. They get bovine leukemia. The, that, the, the, that virus winds up in the milk. Cows get these huge udders, and they step on their own udders, and they get infections. And so the cows get mastitis, so bacteria and white blood cells that winds up in the milk um, it's dirty stuff uh, I, you know on just the basic sanitary level or biological level mm -hmm. so you ask what's in the milk the between the native you know, proteins the growth factors the, uh, the 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 estrogens and the contaminants you said do you want to pour that on your cereal do you want to freeze that and eat it as ice cream or make cheese on it good heavens you know, and I say, you know, you have no more need for the milk of a cow than you do the milk of a moose or a giraffe. You know, well, why, you know would you pour rat milk on your cereal? Well, what is our, well, we're so enamored with the milk of a cow, but the truth is it's foreign, allergenic, antigenic, contaminated, estrogen-laden, growth factor-filled fluid. Yeah. that uh, really is not fit for human consumption. Mm -hmm. So the long answer to a big, powerful <laughs> question. Yeah, wow. Amazing. Amazing what's just in that sort of, that white liquid. It just looks so innocuous. Exactly. Yeah. And people yeah. don't stop to think, you know, if they listed all the ingredients on the, on the carton, it would get really? people thinking more, wouldn't it? Really, it's white. It must be pure. Mm. And they play on that. But the yeah. truth is, it, it's not. And yeah. we, and again, use use hemp milk, oat milk. You define, pick something else, but mm. let's leave the cows out of it at this yeah. point. And, and you know, people say to me, "Oh, well, I, I don't take um, you know the the cheapest milk that I see in the supermarket. I go for the organic." And I know that these cows have been on on um, pasture, and there's no, they haven't had hormones injected into them. So, so this kind of milk is is healthy. What would you say to that? It's a very important question, of course. And, you know, I got to, 
uh, you know, salute the dairy industry's marketing arm. You know, they really, uh, you know, this biological horror show that they're actually running there. They whitewash it, literally the color of milk, they whitewash it uh, and make people feel, oh, it's organic. What does that mean? It means the oats that they're shoveling into the, into the bins there may not have been sprayed with pesticides, but that's about it. Uh, still going back to that earliest of biology we talked about, it's a slaughter industry. You are paying for little babies to be taken away from their mothers. Um, that milk is that still a genetically modified cow that's still putting out milk filled with estrogen. That baby is still, uh, uh, male calf is still destined for a short miserable life in the veal pen. Uh, that mother is going to get shot in the head at age five years when her milk production goes down. Kid yourself not, you are supporting this this. Uh, just horror of a, of a cruel industry producing an unhealthy product, even though the milk is organic, that they didn't use pesticides, sprayed grains, mm. but it's, it's still a slaughter industry that, is, that needs to disappear uh, in all respects. You know, and the people working in the dairy industry, they don't see it they, and they're, they, you know, it's their lives. And, 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 and uh, you know, they're not the bad guy. There's nothing evil. They're lovely people. And they don't understand what, you know, the, they, they close their minds and their hearts to the cruelty, as I did, and as we all do. You know, every one of us who's, who, who grew up eating meat, you know, you didn't think about it. That, that consciousness door hadn't opened. And it's nobody's fault, mm -hmm. but we need to help these people. They're not the enemy. We should, the, the, the government or private industry needs to, to help these people transition. Do something else with your land. Don't run dairy cows on it. Grow broccoli, grow fruit trees, grow, let the forest come back. Do something else with the land. We should pay them. We should pay the mortgage on their house, send their kids to school, make it easy for them to transition to doing something else with their land and let the dairy operations fade in the past there. You know, we, we were, if there were still whaling folk, you know, buy their ship from, help them trans, transition to another industry, but don't, uh, don't keep killing the whales. And you know, let's not keep killing the cows here either on the planet. Yeah, hmm. there's, no, there's no pointing of, of fingers. We've, we've all done it. Exactly. Um, but there came a time in our lives when we, we met, became aware of the facts and, and that caused us to, to change. Yes. So that's really what we're doing now. We're just helping people yes. see the facts and Basically. give them the information that is mostly hidden from them. Yes. Yeah. They say once you look behind the curtain, you can't pretend you don't know what's behind the curtain. You know, you know what this was. and that's what we're trying to do here is tear down that curtain and say, let's get real about what, what's real, the misery on in that curtain that you're buying there. Right. And there's there's better alternatives now. Yeah. So with the, just going back to the, the hormone situation, I know that in Canada, they don't inject the cows externally with hormones. So some people think that there aren't hormones in the cows, but of course, that, as you say, it's just that naturally they produce these hormones. And if, if they're pregnant, then there's a greater concentration, is there not? So you don't have to have it injected into the cow for there to be hormones in the milk. Yes, and th thank you for this. Uh, we, we do need to put a finer point on that term hormones. Mm -hmm. um, a, a hormone is just a substance uh, produced in one part of the body that has an effect somewhere else. Um, the injectable hormone that you're referring to mm -hmm. uh, is what's called uh, bovine growth hormone, BGH. Uh, and yes, it makes cows who are already have these gigantic udders to get even bigger and put out more milk. Uh, but that's a growth hormone. It's a small peptide, small protein. That's different than the natural hormones that every mother cow is making because she's a female animal who's, who's pregnant. Uh, those are estrogens. And, um, and we're not injecting estrogens into the animals. The, the mother cow, she's making her own. And she makes a lot of them. Uh, and it winds up in the milk. So, um, so yes, the organic milk, they have an injected BGH into them. But uh, that, that's really the minor. The, it, it doesn't have much effect on humans. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's not, and so when they say hormone-free, yeah, right. not that injectable hormone. But meanwhile, it's certainly not estrogen-free. That's the right. truth. That's the more, right. yes. by far the more worrisome hormone. Yeah, so that's the, the important point to note there. Yeah, thank you for making that really clear for us. Yeah. But now we do know, of course, that there is something good in milk, and that's the calcium. So um, people will say, well, if I if I give up dairy products, 
where am I going to get my calcium from? Um, and I, I think people are worried because they've heard of, you know, there's a brittle bone disease, osteoporosis, and they're told to drink lots of milk. This is going to build up their bones. Um, but it, that doesn't seem to really bear out in practice, because when you look at the US, Canada, Europe, where people consume vast quantities of dairy products, they have very high rates of osteoporosis. So what's actually going on here? That's such an important uh, point that you uh, focus on here. Uh, you're right. So uh, we Americans, we consume more calcium than anywhere else on planet Earth. And our osteoporosis rate is, is about the highest on planet Earth as well. Uh, so what, what's going on, as you said? Uh, I'll be, uh, well, I'm going to drill into this a little bit, but I will invite my readers uh, or your, your, your viewers uh, to go to my website and see a video I have there called Healthy Bones. And I go into the whole osteoporosis thing that I will encapsulate here for you, but it's on my website, it's called Healthy Bones. So what, what's the story? Well, again, I have to give a begrudging nod of respect to the dairy industry's marketing arm, um, who's, who's convinced us that osteoporosis is a disease of calcium deficiency, which it's not and that the only real source of calcium available to us is in dairy products, which it's not. Uh, they've made us swallow these two fallacies, and so they can say, ah, as you're, as you're implying there, well, where are we going to use the calcium? Your bones are going to fall apart, and don't blame us. We told you to keep drinking your milk and eating your yogurt. But uh, wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> then why, why do we have so much osteoporosis if we're consuming all this calcium? Because osteoporosis is not primarily a disease of calcium deficiency. Uh, to make a long story short, um, when you use your muscles, um, they get bigger and stronger, they hypertrophy, and, uh, and you can see that. Bones work the same way. The more you use your bones, the more you'll use tools and carry loads on your shoulder and, and walk up hills. Um, every time you do that, electrical impulses are created in the bones that make the bone cells spin out more bone, makes them stronger. Uh, and uh, you know, 100 years ago, 300 years ago, you and I wouldn't be sitting in front of computers all day. Uh, we'd be out working in the garden using heavy tools. We'd be carrying firewood. We'd be up on the roof putting shingles on. We, we were physical creatures. And this would stress our bones and our bones would stay strong. And there'd be calcium in our diet where from the same place cows get their calcium. Uh, <clears throat> what I mean, cows don't drink milk, right? Mm -hmm. Where did they get all that calcium to put into the milk? They get it from the green plants they eat. Calcium is a mineral in the soil and it grows it up in the green plants and the cow eats the green plant. And that's where we, uh, that's where the cow gets the calcium to put in the milk. Well, guess what? <laughs> that same calcium is available to us in green plants. And that's why you want to keep eating those generous helpings of kale and collards and um, uh, Brussels sprout and bok choy and broccoli. They're, they're full of calcium. And so we have a big helping of greens every day. There's calcium in beans, there's calcium in nuts and seeds. There's now calcium fortified orange juice. There are lots of calcium around and you don't need that much. We in America are 1500 milligrams. Nonsense, They're that much calcium can give you kidney stones and calcified arteries. You Brits have, uh, have a better handle on it. You, you, the UK is calling for 700 milligrams uh, of, um, which is much more reasonable. And you can get that out of green vegetables. Drinking water's got calcium in it. As I mentioned, nuts, seeds. If, if you take a multivitamin, at the most 300 milligrams, don't be taking 1500 milligrams of calcium, but you don't need the milk of a cow to get calcium. Okay, so, so free yourself from that one. And how to keep your bones strong? Yeah, get your five, 700 milligrams of calcium, but use your bones as the key things. We, we become sedentary. We sit when we eat. We sit when we work. We sit when we travel. We sit, we sit. And as a result, our bones are dissolving. Our bones are atrophying. Um, you know, you don't use your muscles, they turn into guacamole. You don't use your bones, they turn into styrofoam. They turn they, and they crumple. So I, as I say in my video, osteoporosis is largely disuse atrophy of the bones. It's not calcium deficiency. 
the bone itself is dissolving from lack of use. And just taking a calcium tablet or drinking the milk of a cow is, not, is magical thinking to think that's going to suddenly make your bone structure stronger. No, you, you make your bone structure stronger by using them, by getting those elastic bands and, and anything that stresses your bones will make them stronger. So uh, if you're going for a walk, you can get a little, light, a little six pound weighted vest, put that on, grab a couple of light hand weights and go for a nice walk every day for half an hour. Every step you take, a little wild weight goes down your, down your spine, down your hips, down your bone, and your bones respond, they get stronger. Now, every workout you do with those stretch bands or those sitting in front of the TV and little hand weights and, and, and do anything that, that lets you be, use your physical musculoskeletal system makes your bones stronger. So that's the, uh, that's the secret here. It's not a matter of drinking the milk of a cow and, oh, is my bone stronger yet? That's like thinking if I eat brains, I'll get smarter. You know, it doesn't work like that. You know, you got to, uh, you got to use your bones. And finally, there are some things that weaken the bones further. Too much salt, too much sugar, too much uh, acidy drinks like cola drinks, et cetera, uh, cigarette smoke, alcohol. So stop all those things. They, they weaken your bones. But basically, they eat a whole food plant-based diet, emphasizing those green vegetables. Take a good walk every day. Use your bones. And you won't get it. You shouldn't get osteoporosis. You can even reverse it if you have low bone density. Your bones can get stronger. Bone densities go up the more you use them. So use your bones, but if, but don't fall into the, the trap that calcium you know, is the answer and cow's milk is the source of calcium. It's certainly not. Well, gosh. Well, thanks for explaining that. I don't think that is well known about osteoporosis. I, I think there's still general tendency to think you do need lots and lots of calcium to have strong bones so right. that makes perfect sense you know using your bones it's like anything if you don't if you don't use it you lose it so it's just the same isn't it same principle absolutely and i'm glad and you mentioned something very important lots and lots of calcium well let me just say uh, you know, you, yeah, you want that five, 700 milligrams of calcium out of, out of food, preferably, or uh, just a low grade supplement or low for calcium fortified orange juice. But as Dr. Benson said, um, you go lots and lots. Oh, if a little is good, more must be better. People take 1500 milligrams, 2000 milligrams of calcium. Calcium is a dumb mineral. You think it's going to go right for your bones. It's not that smart. It precipitates out in, in tissues all over your body, and you wind up calcifying structures you do not want to calcify, like your arteries, like your tendons and ligaments. You get calcific tendonitis. Um, you get uh, calcific uh, calcification of, of your artery walls. Uh, more calcium is not better. So there's lots and lots of calcium in the hopes that it'll give you stronger bones is really going to give you kidney stones and calcified arteries. So less is more, you know, hold it in that five to 700 milligram range. Oh gosh. Well, thank, th thanks ever so much for sharing that. Very important. Yeah. So for those then who might be feeling a little convinced now from our conversation and do want to make the transition, I know that there's, there's lots of alternatives out there. We've, we've spoken about alternatives for milk. But in my experience, people find it very difficult to give up cheese because we know it's slightly addictive. Perhaps you could explain to us why it is actually slightly addictive and how you think we can get over that. Okay, yes, and it's funny, uh, it's not funny, but how so many of people's evolutions take them to the same point. Yeah, yeah I can give up the, the yogurt, I buy cheese, don't ask to give up my cheese. Um, so what, let's talk about it. what is cheese? Now, cheese is fermented, is coagulated fermented butterfat. <clears throat> and, uh, and it's full of estrogens. Uh, it's full of allergenic proteins, just like the regular cow's milk is. Uh, and it's fermented. It, it, most of it smells like dirty socks. You know, you, you, can, you, can, you can smell the fermentation that it's on its way to being a rotten mass of, of fermented buttermilk there. Um, and, but also people don't realize it is cheese is a high salt product. Um, they use salt to make the, the uh, cheese texture, you know, creamier and coagulate better. Um, but, but cheese without salt is unpalatable. You, you, know, you wouldn't want to eat cheese if it weren't salted. And, but if you look up the amount of cheese, uh, salt in cheddar 
and and uh, um, Gouda cheeses. It's a uh, shockingly high. And uh, these guys who with a high blood pressure and the pot belly have eaten their cheese, ham and cheese sandwiches. They don't realize the huge loads of sodium they're getting. And it's one reason their blood pressure stay up and they put them at risk for heart attacks and strokes. So, um, so where, where, where do you start getting off? And hey, look at it for what it really is. As you, as, a, as you walk past the cheese in the supermarket, well, there's from congealed fermented butter fat full of estrogens and, and pesticides. Probably, I don't think I want to make a sandwich of that. Call it for what it really is. And nowadays, uh, modern foods technology to the rescue, uh, at least here in America, we've got these amazing non-dairy cheeses. People have just been doing some wonderful things with cashews and almonds, and, and they've turned them into these remarkable cream cheeses and, and sliced cheeses and cheese sauces and cream cheeses. It's really working, and they're made of cashews and, and almonds, etc. Does that make them high in fat? Yes, uh, but it's plant fat. It's, it's not animal glazed butter fat. No estrogens in them. Uh, and, uh, and is it highly processed? Yes, of course. You know, you know, cheese certainly is. It's a novelty food. You know, it, it, it's a little bit on your sandwich once a week. You know, it's not going to hurt you. A little bit of smear on your on your morning cracker uh, for one of these nut based cream cheeses. Uh, they're delicious, and and they t they take the place of the dairy cheeses so well these days. And if you hold it, you see it for what it is—a little novelty food, just to give you a little taste treat. Now, then they're absolutely safe to eat, and and that's the second way uh, that you get off the the dairy. The one you know, call cheese for what it really is, and second, move on to these non dairy substitutes. And after a while, you look back you know, if you ever run into some real cheese, you ever taste this? Oh, I can't believe I ever ate that stuff. You taste it for what it really is. Mm -hmm. So um, so it's a kind of a two step process, but that's what I recommend. But it's not that hard. You know, you know, plenty of taste treats along the way. And I know it takes about three weeks for your taste buds to change, doesn't it? Yes. So if people yes. just be a little patient with themselves, they'll find that in three weeks' time, they probably won't like it anymore. <laughs> you know? Oh, Kim, you, you really made uh, that's such an important point. It, it did happen to me when I was a kid. I, I realized I was still a teenager. I was about 15. And I always drank whole milk from, from the farm. And, uh, and uh, milk is whole milk. Uh, and then I don't know where, somewhere along the line, I started drinking skim milk or 1% milk or, uh, and you got to really like it. And then one day someone poured me a glass of whole milk. I started to drink it. I was gagged on it. I couldn't believe it, that, how thick and it was like, tastes like pure cream. And I realized how much my taste had changed and how, how uh, profound our tongue can take us to these different places. And so that's what happens. Tastes do change. Three weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, some say. But your taste does change. And there comes a point where, oh, you, you just, the thought of really consuming this stuff is so unappetizing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I never miss cheese anymore, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so just generally speaking, just trying out those cheese um, alternatives that are now available you know, they, they don't all appeal to everybody, but you might find some that, that do appeal to you and they can just help you to gradually move edge away. You know, that, yes. that would be a strategy to use as well, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes. My diet's getting more and more whole food all the way. I'm eating less and less of mm. those taste treats as well, but I'm very grateful for them. Mm. So if people do move more to, to um, a more of a plant-based diet, um, there's plenty of, of, of calcium and all the other nutrients that they need just, just in plant foods, isn't there? There, there would be no need to be concerned health-wise moving on to a plant-based diet. Really, uh, when you think about it, when I first became vegan in 1981, um, I had, I was, I'm a physician, I'm, you know, I'm a ethical vegan, but I'm, but I'm thinking as a diet, is this a safe thing to do? Is this a reasonable thing to do? Mm -hmm. But I looked at all these magnificent, even back then, or magnificent vegetarian athletes, uh, Bill Pearl and others, weightlifters and swimmers, and well, they could, they run a pretty healthy body on plant foods. And then you look at the other animals, look at every buffalo and giraffe and elephant, uh, gorilla, these massive animals that build these huge bodies on plant-based foods, all completely. 
And um, so, well, it's, it's clearly doable. You know, there's no question. Mm-hmm. And the more I got into the science, yes, the, the, the protein is in all the foods, but the, the legumes, the pulses are uh, particularly rich in protein, nuts and seeds and the whole grains and pulses will give you all the protein you need. Mm-hmm. If you're eating 2000 calories in whole plant foods, you can't help but get 50, 60, 70 grams of high grade protein. It's in the grains and the beans and the fruits and the vegetables and the colorful salads and soups and, and fruits and veggies provide the vitamins and minerals. Again, ask any gorilla, ask any giraffe, they're all, they're all the, uh, the vitamins you need are really in there. We can talk about B12. That's a special case because of modern sanitations pull the natural B12 sources out. So pure vegans have to get, get some, <clears throat> some uh, supplemental B12. But besides that, everything is in whole plant foods. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not that hard. I never really think twice, am I getting enough magnesium today or whatever, because I know I'm eating these big plates of greens. So uh, so after a while, it just becomes easier. Just mm-hmm. keep it in the whole plant foods is the point. Uh, it's the process. So as soon as you start getting into vegan baked goods and, and energy bars and drinks and things, uh, the more processed it gets, the more dead and devitalized and, mm-hmm. and harmful to your health it gets. So uh, eat That's- whole foods, mm-hmm. you know, is the name of the game and you'll be fine. I suppose those kinds of products that you can buy are really just to help you to transition. They're useful. Yeah, for exactly. They're useful for very... that because you're used to a certain kind of taste and that just will help wean you off. But yeah, ultimately absolutely. you're heading towards a, a whole food plant-based diet for optimal health. Dr. Benson just said something very profound and I'm in complete agreement with her that you know, they, oh, there's all these amazing impossible burgers and beyond beef and they taste really tasty and meaty and beefy. And I'm grateful for those burgers. Now, we've got a couple in the freezer for the past six months. We, you know, we, we have one every three months. Uh, but, if they, but if they help Joe meat and potatoes guy start making their transition to a plant-based diet, if he can eat this, and, oh, I could, oh, if that's vegan, I could eat that. You know, you've changed the man's life with this and uh, he shouldn't be eating very many of them either. But as a transition food and these and the non-dairy cheeses, all this stuff, don't you don't beat them every day. But if they help you ease you into a plant based diet, uh, they're very helpful transition foods. So I'm very uh, grateful for them. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Oh, I think we've covered such a lot today. And I'm so grateful for you to share that wisdom with us. I think that's going to be so helpful for so many people. Now, I just want to remind our our viewers and listeners that I am going to put a link to Dr. Clapper's website in the description below. Please be sure to go and have a look there. I, I looked there earlier myself today and it's fantastic resources there, links to documentaries. There's even some free pa- uh, PDF downloads for you. So yeah, please do go and check it out. I'm also going to put a link to a course that I've devised. Uh, it's five lessons. It's called Go Dairy Free and Thrive. It's very well researched. It's a it's fun to do as well. And it's less than $20. And it'll give you all the whys to go dairy free and help you to uh, give you strategies for how to go dairy free. There's dairy free recipes in there, things that you can make at home, even you can make your own cheese at home dairy free cheese. So um, that's well worth checking out as well. So I'm going to put all of those links for you in the description for you to look at later. So thanks ever so much, Dr. Clapper, for being with me today. I do so appreciate it. And um, thank you all for, for listening in. And we'll say goodbye for now and peace out. Take care. Bye-bye.